Man, I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, we are um, starting a new series today, so I'm excited about that. Uh, my name is John Michael Gibson. If it's your first time with us today, welcome. Welcome to Village Church. Um, I'm the pastor here. I get an opportunity to lead such an incredible place. We want to meet you after service, so make sure you fill out a Connect card. Stop by our Connect 10 as well on the way out. So today we're starting a brand new series. Uh, I've titled it Friction. So in, in this series, over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about relationships. Yeah, that's it. I got Marco bringing me something real quick. We're going to have a little bit of a, uh, a show and tell here. Amen. <laughs> Y'all don't even know about Village Church. If you're new here, this is going to get wild. I'm just kidding. It's not that bad. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So we're in a, we're in a new series, and I titled this Friction, and it's about relationships. Because here's the reality. Within every relationship you have, it could be a friendship, it could be a marriage, uh, it could be a dating relationship, it could be just a relationship between you and your boss, you and your children, even between you and God, and there's always a common theme, and it's friction. There's friction in every relationship. The, the problem is what do we do with friction? Oftentimes, friction leads to fighting, right? Like we get, we get mad, and the, the friction all of a sudden starts a fire, and next thing you know, uh, we're, we're fighting with our spouse over the dumbest things. It's like, well, I thought the cups were going to go here when we got married. Well, when I grew up, the cups went over here. Y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. Am I speaking to y'all today? Come on, somebody. Y'all know. Some of y'all got in this argument recently, I guess. I don't know. Let's be honest. Like, for, there's, there's always friction in relationships. And so today, I want to talk to us about a, the most important relationship here uh, outside of our relationship with God, but it's the relationship that represents God, and it's the relationship of marriage. So married couples, get ready. If you're not married, just hang tight, listen, and, and pay attention. If you're ever thinking about getting married, you're going to want to know these things. I'm just telling you. If you are married, pay attention. Don't be smacking your husband or your wife and be like, this is for you. None of that. But y'all go with me to Ephesians chapter 5. This is what the, the writer, Apostle Paul, Paul was a missionary. He went around and told everybody about Jesus. Uh, he was one of the most famous missionaries. He actually wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And this is one of the churches that he spent a lot of time with in Ephesus. And he writes to them to talk about marriage and how husbands and wives should treat each other. And this is what he, he says, And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Then he goes into it, this is what that means. So there's a mutual submission here, and it says, For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Now I'm going to stop right there because people don't like this verse because they think it means that we should just uh, allow our, our husbands to dominate us. That's not what the Bible says. It doesn't say that. It, this word of submission is a word of respect. And I'm going to get into this in just a moment, but I'm going to keep going. For husbands, this is what it means for you. You are to love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of the word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds it and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. They become one flesh, the Bible says. This is the great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. 
That's Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 and 30, uh, through 33. Let me say this real quick because I saw this. Um, somebody asked this recently, and I just want to teach real quick. So Ephesians here, if you see the Bible, maybe you've never read the Bible, and that's okay. I want to teach you how real quick. If you want to know, like, this word Ephesians, that's the book of the Bible, and then the number 5, that's the chapter. So if you're ever looking and you see Ephesians 5, that means like it's the book of Ephesians chapter 5. And then when you see those, those numbers 21 and 33, that's the verse number. So when I'm, when I'm talking and I say, hey, in Ephesians 5, 21, I'm, I'm saying that in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Amen? Okay, that good. And that's, people don't know that. I didn't know that for a long time. So I, I've been meaning to share that. And then the NLT, that's the version that I'm reading from, the New Living Translation. You have NIV, NLT. Uh, we could talk about that later. But today I've titled today's message, Frame the Friction. Frame the Friction. And what I've done is I brought some of, of, of our uh, artwork in our house just because I, I like the people that gave it to me. I'm just kidding. That's not the only reason. This is taken from one of our uh, trustees, Stephen. He, I don't know. If, I think he's here. I saw him. I'm pretty sure. Uh, but he, he made us this. And this is a frame of Miami, okay? Um, I, I like it. It's a cool picture. This one, I can't really set up, but I'm going to have to put it maybe somewhere down. This is J.J. Reddick, okay? Y'all don't, maybe y'all don't know who this is. I'm not a Duke fan, but he's in the NBA, and he signed it. And so I have it. So I like it, okay? Deal? Deal. All right, cool. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to put this back right, right here. So here, uh, maybe that'll fit there. I don't know. No, we'll just put it on the ground. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. Here, my wife took this photo. This is me. It, it, it like some, I don't know where we are, but it looks pretty cool. So uh, I like this one too. We'll put that there. We're going somewhere, people. Y'all are like, what is he doing? I've never seen him do that. Just work with me. Now, this one, this is my favorite because this is of me and my wife uh, pre-pastoring, like before church planting got a hold of us. So if you want to know what it looked like, like, yeah, like when we first moved to Miami, this is it. And another member of our church took this photo of us. So this is hanging up in our, in our house. And, and I like this one, too, but, you know, this one won't sit up here because if it does, uh, it may fall. Well, maybe it will, but if it falls, hey, y'all don't blame me. Here's what I'm getting at, though. With any, each one of these pictures, there's something about them that allows us to focus in. It, it allows us to focus in on what we actually want to see. Because, see, within every one of these pictures, there's an outer frame. There's an outer piece that you are not focused on right now. Things that you can't see, that this frame, it, it has allowed your focus to go in on what the issue is or what the picture actually is. It allows you to narrow your focus. Here's what happens in marriages. Oftentimes, there's friction in the marriage and because we didn't frame the friction correctly, we're focused on everything out here and not on what's in here. And what happens is we find ourselves at odds with each other. We find ourselves opposed to each other because we think friction is bad. It's funny when I meet new couples and they're like, we never fight. <laughs> I'm like, y'all ain't gonna last. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like they're like, it's like an excuse to make sure that everybody knows it's okay for us to get married. Why? Well, we never fight. And I'm like, well, y'all should have a couple of those before you go getting in marriage. You know what I'm saying? Like, because we want everything to be good. We think friction is bad. Friction, no, I don't want friction. No, friction is good. Friction can actually forge an incredible marriage. Because, see, what God did in the beginning is it is natural for us to have friction as man and wife. He took two parts of him. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, it says, let us make mankind in our image. This is God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit coming together and saying, hey, we're going to make a being. And that creature is going to be mind, body, and spirit, just as God is. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to take the masculine side of God and I'm going to put him in Adam. And I'm going to take the feminine side of God and I'm going to put him in Eve. 
Now, some of y'all don't like to hear that there's a feminine side of God. I, God is God. He is all. He's not man nor woman, but he is both at one. That is why we are so uniquely made. But together, we form a relationship that looks like Christ and the church. What do I mean by that? We have two opposite beings. We have a precious woman and a burly man, Adam, and they're told to coexist and be one flesh now. Now, in order for that to happen, it takes grace. Come on, married people. To be one flesh, it takes grace. It takes forgiveness. It takes trust. It, it, there's so many things that we see here. So what the Bible teaches us is that when God created marriage, the purpose for your marriage is so that people will see forgiveness so much on this world, love so much on this world, that they're like, how are these two people together? They're totally different. And what does it do? It shows the perfection of God and the sin of humanity coming together as one. That's what marriage does. But here's the problem. When we get into conflict and we start fighting and we have those marital arguments. I made the joke earlier about the house. That's real. Young people, if you get married, you better make sure you know where you think the dishes are going to go, guys. Because she's going to tell you where they are going to go. Y'all think it's funny. Like, Y'all are laughing. People are laughing because that's a real argument. Well, I thought that we were going to hang the clothes in this closet. Well, I thought the guest bedroom was going to be for this. Well, in my house growing up, we had it like this. And what happens is we start seeing friction. We have friction. And the friction, we can end up forging something beautiful, or we can end up fighting against each other. But the key is we have to frame the friction. What do I mean by that? We have to understand where the friction is coming from and why. I gave you a brief example of the, the coffee cups. I can tell you why the friction is there. It's simply because you were both raised in two different households and the only way you knew where the coffee mugs were in your house, where you walked in and they were on the right, and the only way your couple knew is they walked in and they were on the left, and there's your friction. It's not worth fighting over, but we have this thing inside of it. Well, I want it this way. So how do we get through this? All of us in this room experience friction in our marriages. Let, let me tell you, my wife and I are not perfect. Anybody amen? Yeah. Y'all can amen. Come on, somebody. Y'all better talk today. I don't know. Y'all quiet. I must be talking to some people today. That's fine. Me and my wife, we're not perfect, man. We are just like you. We have friction. We have problems. I do things that she doesn't like. And you know what? She does things that I don't like. People look at pastors, and my wife was showing me this Instagram thing about a pastor's wife speaking and how she was just saying, like, I'm a normal person like you guys, and everybody thinks that we're not, but we are. We're normal people. I'm not perfect. If you think I am, you're way off. If you think that our marriage is perfect, you're way off. So I'm speaking to you from someone that understands the friction in life. There's friction in our marriages, but we have to frame it. So here's the first thing I want you to see in your marriage. This is what everybody needs to know. you got to write this down. Women, this is really for you. I'm just going to be honest, but we don't know what we don't know. Come on, man. Y'all should have been like, hallelujah, we don't know. Well, men, if you ain't listening, that's not a reason not to know. Now, women, y'all should have been shouting. Y'all missing your opportunity. I'm just saying. But we don't know what we don't know. So how do we work through the friction? If we don't know what we don't know, we got to do something. We have to communicate. You want to know one of the biggest keys to taking your friction from fighting to, free, uh, to forging something beautiful? Communication. 
We don't know what we don't know. I can come in and blow up in the house about, man, your shoes are dirty, and you walk through my house, and you just think that I'm mad at you. Now, I'm not that guy because I don't really care. I wear shoes all day long. But you get mad, and, and, and I never explain why. Well, maybe I never told you that when I walked through my house that my father used to spank me with a belt every single time because I wouldn't learn my lesson about taking my shoes off. you got to frame the friction. But see, that takes communication. See, we don't know what we don't know. Wives are amazing at telling us things with your mind. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's incredible how well you tell us with your mind, but then I'm just going to be real. This helps. Like, just say it. See, we don't know what we don't know. The Bible tells us this, that men, your job is to love your wife. Wife, your job is to respect your husband. I'm going to say this hands down. Men in this room, women, listen to me. Men, if you're not married, you're like, this is a lie. If you're married, men desire respect over sex seven days a week. Men want to be respected. It's not they want to be dominant. God created them as this person that is a provider. That he created them as someone that when they see them, they want to love this one. Or they, they want to provide. They want to protect. They want to do these things. But here's our problem, men. We weren't created as the lover. In our heads, we're like, love what? Like, I'm, pro- I'm providing? What do you mean I don't love you? Didn't I put a roof over your head? Didn't I cook? Didn't I? And this is where the friction takes place because naturally the loving person is the woman. Tell me y'all haven't met. I mean, mothers, man, they love, right? The loving person that God created with the natural instinct to love is the woman. The one that he created with the natural instinct to provide is the man. So we already see there's natural friction within that relationship. So what do we do? We have to frame it. We have to communicate with each other. Men, the hardest thing that you're going to learn to do is to love your spouse the way they need to be loved. Because love does not equate to sex. Y'all getting quiet, man. Communication is the key to a healthy marriage. If you don't know why your spouse is upset every time you do something, if you don't start communicating, then you'll never frame that in a way that you can look into it and see what the real problem is. Y'all hear me? If you don't frame the friction by communicating what your past has been like that made you who you are today, that helped develop you. If you are not open with your spouse, I'm going to tell you something, you will live in constant friction that ends in fighting. And men, this is our biggest struggle because we don't want to open up. We don't want to talk about what happened to us. Like I said, God designed us different. We're providers. We're good. We're good. We're good. We don't need the help. Let me tell you, it's the biggest lie the devil's ever told you. Men, if you want to learn how to love your spouse well, I can tell you this, you need to explain who you are and why you are that person, and then you need to listen to them on who you need to help compromise to be. Do you hear that word? compromise to be, because some men are like this, well, this is just who I am. She better learn. No, 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 no. You ain't gonna be married long, brother. It's called compromise, and that starts with communicating. Communication. Bible says that, that you have man and woman. Woman wants to be loved. Man wants to be respected. 
Now, how do we know how to respect our man? How do we know how he receives respect? Communicate. How do we know how our, our woman receives love? How are we going to know? Communicate. Men, sometimes your wife doesn't want another gift. Sometimes she just wants you to listen. Sometimes they, they, they want you to just hold on to them. Women, guess what? So, sometimes you're trying to affirm your man in a way that honestly doesn't even speak to him. It's like I, I, I tell my wife this. I, I cook every night in our house. Now, I, I say probably five days a week I try to cook. We're, we're broke, right? So we, we eat at home. But I like to cook. It's not a, it's not a roll thing. You're like, I do laundry. I've been doing, I did laundry all day yesterday. It's not a roll thing. It's not like, oh, she's the woman, she does this, and I'm the man, I do that. No, it's like we, we're one flesh, and, and we pick up each other's stuff. We, we, you know, whoever needs help or whatever. But my wife, we, we, we heard something a long time ago in a marriage uh, talk, and, and she does this all the time. And it's cute. I like it. Y'all are like, but? But this is what it is. It'll, it'll, she'll say, thanks for cooking, honey. I didn't expect that. Now, think about this. Is, this is an amazing thing, tool for your, for your marriage. When your wife is doing something that she has done quite often, but you've never shown appreciation for it, maybe you should just say, hey, I didn't expect that, because sometimes we get so caught up in our expectations of what our spouse should be doing. When they don't do it, we get mad at them instead of praising them when they do it. Come on, somebody. But it's funny to me now because she'll be like, honey, I didn't expect that. And I'm like, well, I got to eat. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not trying to be rude, but I'm going to cook a steak. Do you want one or not? You know what I'm saying? Like, and I, I say that just because, like, and she knows this. She knows I'm joking. But she knows that, like, telling me that I thank you for cooking, that, I do that anyway. That's not, a, that's not what affirms me. That's not how I receive, like, that love or that, that respect. Another, like, another thing that, like, you know, I, there's just, I'm not even going to get into that. Never mind. The point is, you got to figure out how men to love your wife. Women, you got to figure out how it is that your husband feels respected and disrespected. And, you know, that takes tough conversation. That means when you're mad at each other instead of storming off, forgetting about it, never solving it, never issuing it, never worrying about it, that means you get together and you frame it. And you say, what is the real problem here? Is it that, that you didn't do the dishes? No, that's not the real problem. The real problem is that you always expect me to do the dishes, and today I just didn't do them, and we didn't frame this correctly, and so now you're sitting here saying, I don't do anything around the house. Because you didn't frame the friction. The next thing is, if we don't know what we don't know, and we communicate, the next thing is we won't receive what we don't give. You won't receive what you won't give. Here's what the Bible says about that. Paul says this, that it's a mutual submission. What Paul's teaching us is that it is a mutual sacrifice. Marriage is a mutual sacrifice. It's not one or the other. It's a mutual decision saying, hey, we came in this together. We chose to love one another. And so I am going to love you the best that I can, the best that I know how, the best that you're telling me how every single day. And then the, then the woman, I'm going to try my best every single day to respect you the way that you want to be, or the way that you feel respected, the way that, that that boosts you up, builds you up as my husband. I'm going to try my best every day. Now, here's the thing about you trying your best. Your best is not determined by their best. That means that, well, my husband ain't doing it, so I ain't doing it. Well, my wife ain't lit. She ain't showed me respect, so I'm not loving her. You know, I, I see marriages so often, they just start building these walls up because it becomes, well, they're not doing it, so I'm not doing it. And if marriage is supposed to represent God on this earth, I am so glad that when God looked down on humanity, he didn't say, well, they don't love me, so I'm not loving them. 
if we're supposed to represent God on this earth, I am so thankful that God did not say, well, they're not sacrificing, so I'm not sacrificing. You know, I'm so thankful that God didn't say, well, they're not crying out enough, so I'm not going to worry about them. Our marriages are to represent God in heaven. What did God do? He sacrificed. Despite us. Husbands, there are going to be moments that you have to show your wife love even when she's not reciprocating what you hope that she would reciprocate out of it. You're still called to love regardless. Wives, there are going to be times that you are going to have to still boost your husband up, still respect him in ways that are going to edify him and encourage him even when he's not doing his part of loving you. It's called the sacrifice of marriage. You know, there are times in marriages where one spouse is further from God than another. There are times in marriages where people are, you you just kind of get off track. And you know what we need is we need that anchor. We need that one. One of us in the marriage has to continue pushing forward and continue sacrificing and continue loving even when the other one doesn't. That's how you forge a strong marriage, but you have to frame the friction and you won't receive what you won't give. So if you stand on the side of, well, I'm not going to do it, then neither one of you will ever receive. Jesus was the sacrifice. Paul says, men, our job is to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Now, I love talking about this subject because it it does, like, make, in a bad way, I'm just going to be real women. For so long, this verse has been demonized because it's like, women, respect your husbands. (laughs) Like, that means you better listen to everything he said. No, that's not what it means. It says, that you should submit to your husbands as your husband is submitting unto the Lord. So I'm going to tell you something. If your husband's leading you away from the Lord, that is nothing to be submitting to. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't have cordial life in marriage, but when it comes to, to, to God things, that's not, that's not the way to go. When, he, when, when your husband or your wife is making you do things that are outside of the will of God, outside of God's word, that's not, that is not what the, the Bible is talking about. But I hear this often when women are like, I don't want to respect nobody. (laughs) Sorry, y'all are like, what? But you know what's crazy about this verse? Men, we got this wrong. We look at this and we say, you heard what it said, respect me. If, if If I'm a woman, this is my next thing. Well, you heard what it said, die for me. Think about what it's saying. Who has the bigger challenge here? I'm not saying respect isn't hard, but men, we are required to give our lives up for our wives. That means our wants, our pleasures, our needs, because what God has given us, the Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. So what he has given us, come on, is a treasure. It is not a piece of property. It's not a piece of meat. It's not just something to have when you want and discard when you don't. No, it is a treasure. When God made Eve, he spent intentional time with Eve alone. And I believe this to be the reason why. So that when Eve met Adam, she would know how a man is supposed to treat her. Y'all missed that. We got to give to receive. And that takes sacrifice. God sacrificed for us. When Paul preaches this, he says, men, the greatest sacrifice that you can have on this side of heaven is giving yourself. And that's hard, guys. I, I speak from experience. That's hard. I'm the most selfish person in my marriage. My wife knows it. I know it. It's hard, but that's what the Bible calls us to, and so it's constant sacrifice. I want you to see this because this is the reality. Marriage won't work without work. 
You want your marriage to work, you got to work on it. Nobody drives a car without taking it to the shop to get an oil change. If you do, let me tell you about your car. You don't got one no more. (laughs) Same way with your marriage. If you're not willing to work on it, it doesn't mean it's got to be broken. But I'll tell you, if you don't work on it, it will be broken. And this is what it takes, consistency. Consistency. You got to communicate in marriage. The communication opens the framework up so that we can frame the conversation. We can see the area of where the actual problem is. And then within that framework of what's taking place, then we can find the areas that we both can sacrifice. But we got to frame the friction that we're feeling. And once we get it framed, then it takes consistent work and effort to build that area of your marriage. You know what can't happen is you can't have a conversation, well, I feel this way, and I need this, and this is what I want to happen, and you both sit there and say, okay, sounds good, and you go your separate ways, and you never talk about it again. But that happens in most marriages. There's no stepping stone to a better marriage. It's just, I feel this way. Okay, I'm sorry. We'll make it work. We'll get better. Okay, bye, bye, see you at dinner. And then it's like the question is, well, what did you put in place to make it work? Well, we just said we'd fix it. Well, that's good, but how? It takes consistency. Marriage won't work without work. Young people, if you're thinking about marriage, let me tell you something. It's work. Marriage is not a finish line. It's the starting line. Marriage is not the goal. It's a great thing, but when you get there, you don't stop. It's consistency. It's consistency. You know, I heard a story one time, and this is perfect for uh, the way marriage can be. I have a friend, and, and his dad's a pilot. Um, he, he flies little planes, and not like big planes, but like, you know, the little planes. And uh, his personal plane, he's just flying one day, and he was going from uh, somewhere in Tennessee, um, I want to say to North Carolina, and it was supposed to be like uh, maybe a 30-minute, maybe something flight, like something simple. It wasn't too much. And, <coughs> excuse me, uh, so he gets in his plane, and, and he, he, starts, he starts everything up, and he's, he's going to fly, and, and he, something happens within the first, like, 10 minutes of, of takeoff, and all of a sudden, he, he, like, gets a wind gust or whatever, and it kind of messes things up, and he's like, redirects, and he's like, all right, cool, whatever, and so he keeps flying, and next thing you know, about... 30 minutes to 45 minutes goes by. He doesn't see, you know, he's looking for where he's supposed to be. He's not seeing it. He's like, you know, I'm in the wrong place. Something happened. Something's wrong. And, and, and so he radios in the tower, and he's like, hey, this is such and such. I'm, I'm trying to land here um, in, in, uh, in North Carolina. And the tower comes back, and they, they say, um, excuse me, but you're in the wrong airspace. And the guy's like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm, I'm on a register. I'm, I'm flying from here to, to here to North Carolina. And they're like, no, sir, you're in Virginia. Now, for anybody that doesn't know about flying planes, like, I'm sitting there thinking, like, I don't know how you messed that up. You know what I'm saying? Like, that don't make no sense to me. But here's the, re- the thing about flying is, is when you're in the air, the only way you know in which way you're going to go is by your instruments, by the tools in which you have to follow. And, and if the tools that you are following are not leading you in the right direction, then you're not going to end up where you think that you should go. And so what took place is whenever they had a wind shift or the turbulence hit, When all that took place, something happened, 
And, and his compass that was on the front of his plane, it got off by one degree. Just one degree. And in one degree of a flight that would have been 30 minutes to get him in this direction, he ended up 100 miles away from where he was supposed to be. All because he got off by one degree. When we don't frame our friction and we don't recognize and put it in perspective, what happens is all of a sudden we start getting off by a degree in our marriage. And then over the next 30 years, instead of being right next to each other, you feel like you're 100 miles apart and you don't know why. And I'll tell you, it's because somewhere along the way, you got off by one degree and you never correct it. Some of you in here today, you know the place that it happened. You know where it is. You could be one degree off in your communication today, letting certain things that are really bothering you slide in hopes that maybe they'll just figure it out. Maybe they'll just get it. Maybe they'll, I'm telling you right now, you're setting your compass off by one degree, and in 30 years, you will have no communication. So what do we do? How do we handle this? What, what happens if I feel miles apart from my husband? That's a great question. Or my wife, that's a great question. You may tell you what you do. It goes back to the first thing. You communicate. If you want to know how to fix your marriage when you've gotten one degree off, you communicate. You go back to the place of hurt. You go back to the place of dissension, of separation, and you talk about it. Find out what happened. Where did it go wrong? Where did the degree get off? Which way did we start going? Some people in here today, you may feel that way. You may be in a dating relationship and you feel that way. Communication. It's about talking through the hard things. Let me tell you something. If you're going to spend your life with somebody, you better be willing to tell them every single thing about you. My wife knows everything that I've ever done. Deep, dark, dirty, secret, anything you can think of, she knows. That way, if at any moment we get into an argument, we can frame the friction. I know everything about her. She knows everything about me. Some of you in here, you're dealing with things that you've never opened up to your spouse about, and that's causing so many arguments. And if you would just have the conversation and let them know, you wouldn't be so far apart anymore. The next thing is not just that, but what if my spouse doesn't care? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. I said it earlier, your sacrifice is not dependent upon their sacrifice. We don't sacrifice to the Lord only because they're sacrificing to the Lord. We don't go to God's presence only because my friend's going to God's presence. No, we do it because of who God is in our life. What if they don't care? Then you need to care double. Sacrifice for them. Continue to live in such a way that they feel God, that they, that they know that, okay, I don't understand why they're still being so nice to me. Because I love you. Here's the other thing. What if my spouse isn't a believer? Goes back to our third point. Consistency. Consistency. Continuing to live out the gospel in the face of an unbeliever. Now, I'm not telling you to stay with somebody that's abusing you, that's hurting you, that's beating you. That's not what I'm telling you. I don't even think that God would want you to stay in a relationship that there's abuse involved. That's not what I'm saying. But just because your spouse is an unbeliever, Paul says it later on in Corinthians, it doesn't give you the right to divorce them. He says, on the contrary, 
You should live in such a way that all they can see is Jesus. And who's to say that by your sacrifice and by your consistency, they don't see the love of God and walk right into it? If they don't care, you care. If they don't believe, remember, you believe. And here's the greatest news of all. It doesn't matter about any of what they believe, what you believe, any of that. What matters is what God is capable of doing in the midst of all this. If you're a thousand miles apart today, I got news for you. God redeemed his people, and because he redeemed us and we have a relationship with him, he has the power to come into your marriage and to fix it, to replace it, to redeem it, to bring your husband out of darkness into light. He has the ability to bring your wife out of darkness and into the light. But here's what we got to do, church. We got to pray. We got to believe. We got to continue to be consistent. We got to keep communicating. And we got to keep sacrificing just like Jesus did for us. Jesus continues to this day to seek us even when we're not seeking him. And if marriage is to be like the relationship with Christ in the church, hear me out, then marriage is a constant pursuit of one another. And it's a constant race to the back of the line. It's a constant pursuit of each other, but it's a constant race to the back of the line. How can I serve you? Honey, how can I serve you? If your wife had a long day, men, do the dishes. If that's not a part of your life, do them for her. Women, if your husband came home and he, he had a hard day, I don't know, go cut the grass. Maybe that's something you don't do. Car like my picture's like, my, my wife's like, nope. <laughs> she said, no on that one. But there's ways that we can come into our marriages and we can alleviate some pressure within our spouses if we actually communicate with each other and recognize, hey, this is bothering me. This is bothering him. This is, this is you know, one thing that I love that my wife does and she knows this, I love it when my wife does cook when I've had a super long day and I love to cook and I want to eat something good and I come home and she's like, I've cooked. Some of you men blows your mind. She finally cooked. That's a simple way. That's a simple way that, that she can help me. Sometimes when she comes home, I do the dishes because she does the dishes typically, but I'll, I'll do the dishes because I know she had a long day, and I just want to make sure that when she comes home into this environment, that the stress that she has from work is left there. I don't like doing the dishes, but I do it for her. See, so if you want to have a healthy marriage and a healthy relationship, church, it takes sacrifice. It takes finding those areas in your life they need to be fixed, they need to be changed, communicating that, sacrificing in those areas and being consistent. I want you to stand up with me right now, wherever you are. Maybe you're in here today and uh, we have our prayer team. I'm gonna go ahead and call them down front. Um, James, Ada, if you're in here. call them down front. Now, I, here's what I want you to do, church. Maybe you're in here and you just say, man, I I need prayer for my marriage. Maybe, ma, ma, James, if you need prayer, I'll pray with you. Ada, if you need prayer, I'll pray with you because everybody needs prayer, okay? But this place down here is open. And maybe you came in here. This is not an embarrassment, so get that out of your head. I'm sick and tired of people that call Christian. I, I'm about to get on a tangent, but y'all work with me. They call Christians hypocrites, and I hate to say this, but you're only a hypocrite if you're not here. At least by being here, I'm letting you know I got problems. Come on, somebody. I'm letting you know I got issues. I came to the house of healing because I need healing. That's not hypocritical. That's pretty honest. 
Maybe you're in here right now and you say, man, I need help with my marriage. I need help with my relationship. Maybe husband and wife, I want to challenge you. Come down here, find prayer with our brother or our sister. Let them pray with you. Maybe your husband or your wife's not here. Maybe you're just praying for a relationship. Whatever it is, we have people down here ready to pray with you. I want to offer this time during this last song. Make your way down to the front. Grab your spouse's hand if you need both of you to come down and pray. And let's pray, church. Father, I just ask right now in this moment that as people move, God, as, as people begin to move, that marriages in this place would be restored, that hearts would be made whole. Lord, that as people begin to move, there would be a, a, a new sacrifice in their hearts for their spouse. There would be a new communication in their hearts for their spouse. Father, as people begin to move, I just ask in the name of Jesus that you would be the healer, that your hands would be on them. Father, that you would be the one to restore their marriage back to the way that you wanted it. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Make your way down to the front and let's worship, church.